So, Brother Patrick, otherwise known as artist, as family, I, I don't know if that's you or your whole family, but I think that's the point of it. Um, and I first met your your beautiful family years ago on a, um, this is two or three years ago. It wasn't long ago, yeah. but you know, long enough to, to become like really good friends. Our families have, um, have a good friendship, um, but we met in... Um, a webinar what was the it was the stoa i think it was um no you uh we were both on the queering permaculture queering permaculture that's yeah. the one yeah that's the one no all right I, I got you mixed up with that um the person who introduced us to as well, or said that we should get together that was on the stoa and then yeah it was the queering permaculture one with uh, guy ratani and everything else yep. and um i can remember i like i made a really distasteful joke because you were there like as always except for now it wasn't just you 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 had the whole family there and i made i made a joke that you, you look like the manson family <laughs> <laughs> which you know you did you didn't laugh about until later and but your your beautiful partner has never laughed about it <laughs> and it is is like still like quite upset with me like to this day like every every now and then i get an email from her saying hey that joke was really bad you know, really pissed me off <laughs> so anyway i'm uh, as always i start start our conversation with an apology for that <laughs> intro i got no filters uh, i got no filters that's a problem um and so you're a, a um a circular living in good relation on jaja run country in good relation with the country and with uh, custodians of the land there which you know automatically makes you quite um profoundly unsettled um mm -hmm. Which, which problematizes the, the the word settler <laughs> in introducing you. So yeah, there isn't really a word for what you what you are yet. Um, yeah, and you're you're living very much the dream in that you 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 have uh, land, real estate that you you know you can hold and have access to, and you are turning that to a good regenerative use and um, homeschooling and you know, uh, connecting with the community and making lots of networks um, and, you know, like doing really sustainable and self-sustaining sort of agriculture and uh, all kinds of trading practices with the community. Um, but then also quite a big online presence and a lot of um, thinking, hmm. you know, for, for want of a better word, um, because, you know, we, we there's people out there who are thinkers. Now, I don't know. Is that does that um, does that not show you Sorry. not show you in a fairly good uh, in a, in a decent way? Uh, yeah, it does. Sorry, that was my all right. um. All right, now, now you do me. My oldest boy just um trying to get through to me. I'm just gonna turn on turn the phone off. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I just yeah. Uh, now you now I do you okay yeah 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 well um I guess uh, my intro to you was through Sand Talk and um, yeah it, I I felt like it was uh, uh, the first a first person's version of my thesis that I brought out in a second people mindset several years before um, just like examining what I arrived at. Um, what I call the, the culture that I was born into, um, hyper-techno civility, um, the hyper-mediation and the hyper-tooled um, uh, version of civility or empire. And um, yeah, so I was really drawn to you. Um, I invited you up here to, to meet um, some mob up here and Beck Phillips and her, her man, Mitch Boney. And and to sit with Anitra Nelson, a degrowth um, activist, and yeah, to see where indigenous perspectives and degrowth perspectives might intersect. So um, yeah, so that so my love affair with you uh, began with Sand Talk, and um, and then it, we quickly moved into COVID, and our families have been toing and froing, and sort of like finding ourselves in similar but different places, and. Yeah, navigating that relationship um, as the 
the world radically transformed, particularly since mm. late 2021. And yeah, so um, my my spouse is you know has a really strong relationship, um, you know, with you and the, and the and the family, which is you, um, as well. So we you know over COVID we we fo um followed. You, you took a journey, a, a bike bicycle journey. Yeah. Um, I think it was just before, but it was, you know, so your whole family just got on bikes and just went, you know, on a big, I mean, it's not a pilgrimage, it's not a, not a journey, it's not a voyage, you were, you know, living mobile on the road and, um, and documenting this day to day. And, and so we were following mm -hmm. the posts of your sort of daily, mm -hmm. you know, journey and, um, and you were, you were attacked at one stage, one place you were staying, we, you had a, 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 a a terrorist attack by citrus, <laughs> citrus fruits in the night. <laughs> yeah, we got attacked by the tribe called the Lemon Hurlers and uh, Lemon Hurlers, some hey. young, young teenage fellas who um, yeah. found Auntie Joe's lemon tree and decided to rock the town. And they found us down by um, sneaky camping by the footy oval, and, yeah, yeah. and we got we got rocked by them by those now, lemons. What 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 I'm what I'm really interested. And exploring with you that you know i wouldn't feel particularly safe exploring with very many other people on the planet um if i'm not close to them you know um mm -hmm. actually there's heaps of people i'm close to that i still don't feel <laughs> safe exploring this um but i do feel safe with you um ha having a look into this it's 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 the way over covid um our ways began to part Mm. um ideologically mm. now pre pre-covid we were pretty uh just or at least in the things that we spoke about we were fairly aligned and then, um, when i came out to your place we connected fairly strongly over some um uh Gaddafi nostalgia <laughs> for a start <laughs> mm. <laughs> which um over time i came to reframe as um as, as disinformation mm -hmm. um, from Russian propaganda. And the more I looked into it and the more I spoke to people um, from that part of the world, you know, <laughs> who, you know, didn't fit into the the social groups that were, um, you know, the dominant culture there, um, mm -hmm. that I, I came to see in a very different light. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then the sex dungeon stuff came out and I, 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 I um, spoke to some uh, people connected to victims of that, and um, and I sort of had to start reforming my opinion. It was like one of my children had, had died. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how emotionally attached I was to the idea of Gaddafi, you know, because lots of our mob had gone and spent time with him. So anyway, we connected really strongly over that. And I think I shared with you, Luke, like the lost chapter from... Sand talk, yep. uh, verbally at least, yep. which which ended up ended up cutting from the book, which was it was all Gaddafi nostalgia and like just a sort of anger, <laughs> mm. you know, about mm. the fall of um, of that land, um, and it's just descent into madness and slavery and all kinds of horrors afterwards. Um, yeah, so we, we were about there, and and so then you could see from how I've described that my trajectory as we went through mm -hmm. and ideologically and everything else. And then your trajectory was from what I could see in our communications on email was the opposite direction. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, my, I had begun, uh, just before I met you in my, uh, studies of disinformation, especially online radicalization and stuff like this, um, uh, through RMIT, I was doing a research project there. Um, I was particularly following how this plays out in Indigenous communities. And it wasn't a particularly, it was a really niche topic until COVID happened. And then suddenly it was very relevant. It's been up those since then. Um, you know, so I spend about, I spend about 10 hours a week, you know, on this project and have for a couple of years now. Um, so I, I was following through all of the, um, you know, the extreme alt-right uh, disinformation channels, which, by the way, you know, intersect through that horseshoe effect with with a lot of the left um, now as well, and a lot of people are jumping the horseshoe. So that's a phenomenon I was looking at as well. Um, 
yeah, through that, the sort of hot spots of information that I was seeing, uh, seeing coming up each week, and the um, um, the topics and patterns and messaging around disinformation, I was seeing that in your emails too, and I was like, ah, oh, yeah, butterman's, yeah, like uh, got an algorithm there, and then and I didn't say anything to you until you sent me that trans that trans article. Mm-hmm. And then we had a, I don't know, about as close to argy as we've ever come. And I'm like telling you, you're a red pill mega and you're telling me that I'm a, that I've become a shill for, you know, um, the colonial institutions and big farmer and shit like that. And then we went, and then you're like, debate me, bro. And, <laughs> and then I'm like, ah, oh, mm. there now that it is red flag. And then I went, oh, I don't know, but then I don't know. We just fell back into our old patterns, and we, we said, "Oh, we're, we're going to have to talk about this." And that was ages ago, and we never really got around to it. Yeah. And so here we are, around to it. We may share it with people if it's useful, yeah. and we may freaking not. <laughs> sure. Anyway, so that's that's from from where I'm sitting, from my fire, how all that rolled out, and what that looks like, and where my interest is in it, um, which. As I wrap up here, long-winded as it is, it's a profoundly relational interest mm. for the purpose of this this yarn. Mm. It's just uh, it's about us caring for each other. Yeah. Uh, I, I, either you're going to save me from Big Pharma. Um, <laughs> what sparked this was when you sent me the RFK. <laughs> yeah, good. I, I got the RFK yeah, yeah. Um, propaganda, and I went. I, I fucking I have to talk to Brother Patrick. <laughs> Um, so either you're going to save me from big pharma or, um, you know, or, or I'm going to save you from like, you know, the massive, um, billionaire dark money funded disinformation complex, um, or, um, probably as we find in our dyadic way of being in these relations and knowledge, um, Probably neither of those things and a little of both, but something else. So mm-hmm. <laughs> how, how do you, how do you come into this yard? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm grateful that this conversation is taking place. I think that there's so many that are just not, and people are turning away from each other, um, projecting, um, labels onto people, um, absolutely shredding the nuance from discussion and um, relationships have been severed and are continuing to be severed. So I just want to say thanks. Thanks for yeah, yeah. reaching out. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really keen to explore where it is that um, <clears throat> we're both at at the moment and um, stay really open and curious to where you're at. Mm. And just share a little of how I before are... you before you go on. Mm. This is still directing you back into what you're saying. Mm. Um, with the passive voice, their relationships are being severed. That's like I need a subject of the verb there. Who's severing these relationships? Um, yeah, good, good question. Um, maybe you okay. don't have to answer it now, but maybe we'll explore it as we go along. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, I mean, for for me, there's been enormous amounts of relationships severed um a a kind of turning uh closing uh, doors to our family um a kind of uh even within our own kind of uh social ecological community there's been lots of severed relationships um and Mm. yeah lots of labeling labeling us as anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists and um right-wing conspiracy theorists and all the all the usual garbage um, that people who don't want to debate or don't want to yarn or don't want to be relational um, find themselves using to take down someone else. And so we're, mm-hmm. yeah, we're, they're the sorts of relationships that have been severed, but at the same time, there's been an abundance of relationships um, that have sprung out of this time. So... Um, yeah, so I'm I'm really open to um, yeah. I feel like the the intro um, the intro of me 
regarding some of the, the emails we've been toing and froing over the last several months um, is a little, I find it a little bit of a projection. Um, and, it, and and I guess some of that reductive language uh, I'm responsible for too. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of putting us both on notice to, to slide away from, um, you know, labels like disinformation and anti-vax and transphobic and all of those um, sort of uh, beautifully curated labels to help divide and and cancel out um, nuance mm. and relationships. Mm. So um, I'm finding that I'm, I'm finding I'm finding a lot of that. Um, yeah, I mean, the, but I mean, the, it, it is a pattern in the world. You know, the mainstream media does it as well. And very reluctant to um, call a coup attempt a coup attempt. Mm. You know, for example, and um, you know things like this. Um, there is this tendency to try on both sides everything. Um, you know, if something happens, it's like, well, some people say it's this, but then on the other side, some people are saying it's this, um, you know, but they're not really, you know, um, investigating or analysing the um, ah, the motivations and the agendas of the people who are saying those things. You know, um, some people are reporting, you know, things that are measurable and recorded, and then some people are... Um, just projecting wild fantasies and both of those are uh, treated equally um you know in this kind of both sides in thing and in the same way debate is is not debate you know debate is a way for a, a salesman to get their foot in the door sure. you know I'm, I'm finding um it's a little bit like i mean i think the best analogy i can come up with is you know those men who you know will be harassing women walking down the street darling darling Darling, come on, give us a smile. You can at least be friendly. Come on, you, you know, at least be friendly. You don't have to be mean to a fellow. Give us a smile. So she like, gives a strange smile and it's like, woo, yeah, she wants me, she wants me. Come on, boys, let's have a look. Go on, show us your, you know, and, and then off it goes from there. I'm, I'm finding a lot of it's like that. You know, when I engage, um, when I engage with people, I'm putting a lot of this, it's not necessarily in good faith. Um, they're not really interested in the idea that there might be more to know. And so, I mean, they're very quick to call, ah, there's no nuance. You don't have any nuance. But, you know, um, you know, usually the people they're yarning with are prepared to shift mm. on things and are constantly shifting as new information comes in, yeah. but they're not. So if you've got an immovable force meeting a you know, a fluid object. <laughs> it's there's not really any kind of interaction or relation there at all. It's just destruction. So, um, you know, so I, th I think a lot of the mm, a lot of the behaviours we'll see will be defensive behaviours, mm. and then other people will be, you know, trying to be proactively offensive, um, in, in an effort to um, combat uh, authoritarianism. Um, um, fascism, which is on the rise and which is undeniably accompanying, um, you know, all of these narratives mm. and all of this propaganda, you know, it, it usually comes alongside, you know, exhortations and towards and glowing references to, you know, uh, what Orban's doing and what Erdogan's doing, you know, Hungary, Turkey, uh, Philippines, they just execute them in the streets. So, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, the, these, the, it's, it's usually a lot of real fascist rhetoric and it's usually overblown into these people are going to, these people want to destroy us. They want to destroy our way of life. They must be stopped. This is a spiritual war between good and evil, between angels and demons. Um, and, you know, it's your life is at stake and your children's lives are at stake. You've got to do something, which, you know, is, you know, quite obviously stirring people towards violence, public violence, organised public violence. And then, of course, the phenomenon of your lone wolf shooters, which we are not immune to in Australia anymore because we're starting to have a few of those pop up here and there as well. Um, so that's where we are in Australia and New Zealand. That's that's becoming an issue as well. Um so there's, you know, information isn't just information. 
you know, it's packaged, it's coming from somewhere mm-hmm. and it's coming in patterns and it's coming in waves. And, um, you know, that horseshoe with the ends of the horseshoe are getting pushed together real tighter and tighter until you've got um, hippies sitting down in the drum circle with bloody skinheads at a Canadian truckers rally, you know. Um, and then at the same week, we've got in Melbourne on a billboard, someone spray painted up there, um, I hold the line, Canada. You know what I mean? It's a freaking small world when it comes to information, brothers, and I'm seeing patterns in there. What are you seeing? Um, I'm, I'm seeing it differently. Um, I think the, yeah, the, when you, you did your black pill article on ABC online, um, I reached out to you and said, um, that I didn't feel that conspiracy theories within indigenous communities or non-indigenous communities was nearly as dangerous, um, as, uh, uncritiqued power that mainstream media is continuously uh, um, continuously um, providing an un, an yeah a non non critiquing of power, and I feel like that for us is a structural difference. That I was pointing out that you're writing this article from a government-funded and highly influenced. I mean, ABC journalists and and peeps have been yelling and screaming about government interference for 30 years, and we've seen this slow creep of it becoming less and less independent and more and more uh, an arm of government, what I call government misinformation or um, government manipulation. And so even though I trust the ABC in certain stories, I wouldn't with others. And I guess why I'm led there is people like Marianne DeMarcy, who is a former ABC um, science journalist and producer who was um, pretty much uh, not sacked, but like kind of forced into oblivion um, after she did a piece in 2016 on uh, the overprescription of statins. And the overprescription of statins uh, as an industry, was like Pfizer and Co's biggest profit uh, drugs at the time, in, in around 216, 217. And just her st- telling the story of how she was completely uh, silenced from being uh, accolades um, by her bosses to within a few days, like the show absolutely stopped, pulled down, and um, <laughs> uh, basically... Um, uh, people like Norman Swan um, saying people will die if they watch this program. You know, really hysterical stuff. And and then finding out that Norman Swan has, you know, just before COVID started a chemist to you business. He's the director of a corporation, which is the highest, um, the largest medical um, advertising indus- uh, company in Australia. And, you know, he has real vested interests in the pharmaceutical industry. And he's like the go-to guy for most sort of liberal leftist um, people on the ABC who was really responsible for getting rid of Marianne de Marcy. Well, just quickly, were there not, were there, were there not people dying? What was that? Uh, from, were there not people dying from following um, uh, treatment protocols um, that, that were not based on any research and not not, not prescribed. So I mean, there, there were there certainly were people dying. So I, I just I just I just have to go out like I'm I'm not sure if it's an overreaction to say people are going to die from uh, you know like I think when when those things are coming out, it's um. So Swan Swan was talking about yeah. Swan was talking about people will die if they watch this um, expose. This four years of research. Um, that was peer reviewed and like a, a very well researched deep dive into the statins industry. And Norman Swan was, is saying people will die if people uh, watch this and they stop taking their statins. And now it's really um, the evidence for over prescription of statins is, is, has mounted ever since. And there's real corruption that stems to Oxford University. It's a big story. You can follow um, Marianne de Marcy's gone on and become a major writer for the British Medical Journal. Uh, and, you know, she 
she's been a, a real go-to for us in terms of COVID. Is is her work more? Uh, is it does it have a bit more quality than uh, Wakefield's research? I haven't looked into Wakefield's research. Yet. All right. Okay. But um, um, so she Wake, Wakefield's. Um, um, I, I know the story, yes, but I haven't. Stuff was yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't looked into it. And it was yeah. It was found that he was actually being funded by um, by big legal <laughs> in the end with people who were looking to make an easy an easy killing um, in the sort of vaccine injury law uh, that he he had funding from them. But he also had an interest in he had um, uh, patents on separate measles. Um, and mumps vaccines. So, you know, that's why he went quite specifically after the MMR combo, yeah. um, you know, in, in really pushing that uh, that narrative of autism yeah. um, being caused caused by pharmaceuticals. That's, you know, I have no opinion on that. That's not my area of interest or um, concern, but I, I do. One of the things that um, I read... So I'm, I'm just, I'm not finding any, I'm not finding any research that's, that isn't... Um, uh, problematic in that way so um you know if we're talking about in, you know a, a critical approach are you, you know, to critiquing these things and i guess we'll get into in a minute we'll get into the critiques of power too yeah because i think that's um i think that'll get more more broad into the source of um, the knowledge rather than you know um i don't know the nitty-gritty of a thousand a thousand facts and flowers blooming are you can i just getting I... kicked up all over the shop can I just ask you a question um, regarding the overprescription of medications? Do you do you think that's a thing? Do you think there's a what, that medications are prescribed? The overprescribing of medications. So the, oh yeah, there, hell a, yeah, yeah. Okay. And you look. I mean, it, but yeah. the, these are and and the the institutions that are in place to regulate these things, um, they they off they've they've dropped the ball on a number of occasions. But these things are always revealed and followed up, and then they, you know, and and there are consequences for them. Like for the with the opioid epidemic, mm. for example, this is you know, this is something that all the right institutions and uh, science and everything else has a consensus on. You know that this was caused by, um, you know, bad actors and and you know and and massive bloody corporate greed. Mm. Um, you know there are powerful actors out there. You know acting to change the world um it's I've, i i wouldn't say that those people are just you know the, the liberal media and you know uh, i don't know um who are the who are these powerful figures so you know is it george soros no i i don't see it i don't is see it, it that um, way at all i feel like it's just a like the overprescription of medications is, has just been a step-by-step -step slide. Um, and with more and more reg government regulators being uh, funded by the industries themselves, there's, then there's the revolving lunch, the revolving door. Um, you know, this is this, this lobbying. These are just basic things like that have become systemic. So rather than just one or two people who are you know acting nefarious it just it's just actually become commonplace so which are the medications they haven't caught out yet because you know i mean there's of course the opioid opioid epidemic thing there's you know all the other ones historically that you can list from thalidomide right up until today well um, I, I think i, think I mean it's... even bad aspirin bad aspirin gets yeah. caught out in the end yeah. um you know there's always when when these unethical practices happen they, they always get caught up with in the end yeah well and I by mean... the way there, i did not receive a memo from my institution telling me to say these things and uh, yeah I, I have uh <laughs> yeah i have i have very little stake in uh you know mm. not, not going against the grain you know as an anti-colonial and um basically anarchist mm. um sort of indigenous researcher i'm, I'm yeah quite uh quite anti-institutional well, that, that leads me to i guess the, the next point like about 50 percent of indigenous australians took the vaccine Whereas non-indigenous Australians, it was like ninety-five percent. So yeah. it's like, you, to me, um, the, the the you know the source is um, GP News. If you want to find that source, um, there's an article there from twenty twenty-two. But um, yeah, the yeah we had a lot of elders who uh, we were anti-vaxxers and putting out a lot of material. We had a lot of uh, a lot of um, when you say when you say anti-vaxxer, what do you mean by that? What can you um, describe that? Uh, well, I guess it's shorthand in, in the same way that some people go shorthand for woke 
uh, for what I'm saying, mm. I guess. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, but, uh, people who, you know, very specifically, uh, who previously were, were, um, were against uh, vaccinations in general and have been for decades. Um, I, I won't mention names, but, you know, um, and, and one of the, the elders who was a leader in that, um, I, I don't want to say his name because it was two recent he's passed away, but, um, yeah, he, he actually died of COVID, um, you know, as well. Um, but there was, there was a lot of, and when I say disinformation, I mean insane disinformation yeah, going see, around. Like I, the Jews are after us. I, I saw kind, some of kind of levels of, of yeah. disinformation. And, I, I you know, saw some of that. There are, but there that are wasn't concentration the camps being set up for Aboriginal people who are unvaccinated. Mm. And, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I saw some of that, but I also know a whole bunch of Indigenous friends who didn't take it, and not because they had some some you know head in some American derived conspiracy theory. It's just um, they didn't trust. I mean, I I what I see is 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 a farmer colonization is a thing, and it's it starts with the overprescription. It starts with um, medical journals being um, uh, captured, and what I mean by that is um, even even certain things like editors having all liability um, removed um, from from stepping into those roles. So the legalism that is has happened around that, um, but also, you know, like in Australia, for example, we're still in some sectors mandating uh, vaccines whereas most european countries and japan have 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 stopped them either for the entire population or for people under 70 or people under 60 or whatever but you know we're we're still like pushing these things and so there's this you know we, we we don't even have a media that's curious um about why these countries are what are winding back these vaccines so to ask answer your question about you know what's the most current medication that um, is being wound back? Um, it's 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 all there. It's all available um, in Switzerland and in. Um, well, the, yeah, the reason the reason they're doing that is because uh, because of lobbying because um, it's more profitable. So if you, if you're selling um, medications, you know, individually to people who are choosing to have it, mm-hmm. then there's no price cap, and you can keep putting the prices up the same way you do for insulin. You know, but when it's under big government government contracts for mass medication, you know, like you only see for things like vaccine vaccines, um, you know, it's the the profit margins are a lot more fixed and uh, limitable, <laughs> and there's too many limits on them, and you can't just like uh, increase increase the the price by five hundred percent mysteriously for no bloody reason because the government won't let you, you know. So it's actually more profitable for big pharma um, to have less where they people take away that. with it. In most places in the world where they can get away with it, they'd rather sell it as individual doses than as mass medications because you make a killing on it. You can charge people bloody five hundred bucks a shot if you feel like it. Mm. So um yeah, so that's the thing. If you if you're talking about following following the money and you know, qui bono and all that kind of thing. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, I think pharmaceutical companies are inherently evil as corporations. And, you know, I, I really resent having to trust my body and roll the dice and the body of my kids and my family every day, the same way you do mm. in doing that. But I don't think these guys are, um, are actually the, <laughs> are actually this in, in, in this instance, you know, I, I don't think, um, I don't think greed, Greed is a motivating factor there, you know. I, 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 everything that I've everything that I've found out, and this is coming from an extreme, you know, vaccine skeptic position that I, you know, maintained over a decade. Um, you know, um, yeah. In the end, I I can't find any evidence of that. And in fact, I can find a lot of evidence to the contrary. Um, you know, I, I can. It, there's a lot of um, circumstantial stuff. Mm-hmm. that you can stack up and stack up and stack up until it seems like heaps. And then you've got RFK, Robert F. Kennedy, RFK Jr. standing there. It's a junior, I can't remember. He's standing there with his big, like he'll print them all out and go, here's this stack, and now here's this stack. 
Who are you going to believe? You know, and I think most people looking at that will go, yeah, yeah, bros. Yeah, fucking I believe the big stack, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, let's, it's, I'd, it's like like, to, yeah. I'd like to talk mm-hmm. about our... There's problems with this way of thinking. There's problems with the logics yeah, there is. behind it. And this I mean, is why you have uh, scholars and academics as annoying as they freaking are yeah. and, and quants looking into all this stuff because, um, you know, we can be misled by things like this. Yeah. I mean, one of, one of the things that I um, find with RFK Jr. is that he began in a very similar place to me with um, looking into, like Vandana Shiva, looking into the chemicalization of agriculture and, and mercury and water. Yeah. And the effects on human health and human biomes, that is. And so, you know, from, from that perspective, um, RFK and Vandana Shiva and many other people uh, like myself and, and my friend David Holmgren and Sue Dennett and a whole bunch of us, you know, um, Tammy John S and a whole lot of people in the um, regenerative agriculture, permaculture space um, have been really aligned with, um, you know, the pro- looking at it, deep diving into the problem of GMOs and the effect on human health and ecological health. And so... So when um, when this guy who's now standing as a presidential candidate and has about twenty percent already of interest, he he's basically um, you know twenty years ago then said actually there's a problem with the overprescription of vaccines. Should we have a conversation about this? Is this just the industry like uh, inventing illnesses because vaccines are such big money, or do we actually need to have them? And so he took this. So he's, you know, he gets mislabeled as an anti-vaxxer all the time, just as we do. It's like there is no, there is no possible way of understanding that it is no possible way to call every single vaccine that comes onto the market safe and effective or relevant to human health. There is just no way to do that, just as there's no way to say that every single vaccine is dangerous and detrimental to human health. But we can't. Even... These are reasonable conversations to have, but they come in a context. Yeah, they and... come in a context and a raft, a, a raft of other other um, uh, propaganda, uh, heavily, heavily, heavily politicized issues. Such a, um, such that, a... that that they come to they they come they come with you like you, you know when you your ham and ivermectin paste sandwich, you know, they come together. You get the ham as well, and the ham in this case is the trans transphobia. And the, you know, um, you know, like, um, you know, problematizing, you know, trans kids in sport, oh, you know, they need to have their genitals inspected before the race and all this kind of stuff. Um, mm. so, you so know. I guess, <laughs> I guess for me that the, the, the trans, um, subject is, is really none of my business because it's not my community in terms of culture and identity and things like that. I have trans friends. Um, who yeah, have, have a but huge, the, huge the email that you sent me when you passed on passed yeah. on some literature about that that was that was when I first um, yeah. um, started but to have I, some concern that I this just, you know, just the healthy of... skepticism on this yeah. topic and this topic and this topic I guess you know, because because it was because it was lining up with exactly the same patterns and rhythms you know uh, of the alt right I was concerned for you that your <laughs> algorithm was sending a tail of content and maybe twisting things a right. little but the same with the questions of overprescription and pharma colonization that I've had for many many years as far back as GMOs and looking at these big indus- industries that are extremely powerful and profitable and and just the incursion the capture through lobbying the capture through revolving doors decade after decade after decade getting worse and worse and gradually worse so it's the same thing what i arrived at is looking into the the medicalization of kids who um call themselves trans and so the um extreme basically getting kids on to a lifetime of drug dependency from the pharmaceutical industry that that is the that is the question I feel like as a society that we need to have broadly. So, mm. and every every other issue around trans is culturally I'm totally aligned with, but I'm mm. not I'm not aligned with more pharmacolonization of people's bodies, and I feel like that needs to be a societal conversation. Mm. There's big. Uh, um, that's um. <clears throat> see, and this this comes back to um. You know, not not on when, when you when you zoom in on that, um, 
we're uh, you know when you get a bit more granular around these issues we're, we're poles apart but in the broader sense we both started out our relationship and our yarns together around the inefficiency of um of of the institution known as a nation mm-hmm. that having these massive nation states these just unwieldy you know industrialized things that were built for mass control and monoculturalism and colonization of all peoples and all languages, you know, or a cont or a massive with the country or whatever, all the bioregions and little different, you know, languages and dialects and cultures and everything, you know, in that place, you know, becoming going under massive centralized control. You know, I think, um, you know, my community, your community, um, and even like the crypto bros community and lots of other communities are, you know, are really starting to talk up the problems um, that come with sort of, you know, massive bureaucracies and, you know, massive institutions that really mm. are inefficient at scale. And when they scale, it's inefficient, you know, particularly for the individual on the ground or different families who have different needs or different uh, environmental factors, histories, you know, including health histories, et cetera. So yeah, there, there's, there's problems with that for sure. And that's, that's something I'll fight until I die is that, uh, you know, colonization of everything. Mm. But when we come down to the granular level and we start to zoom in and, and go, well, you know, we've got to support this like amazing fucking RFK coming out. who's like, you know, he's going to be our retribution and our avenging angel in this space, then it's um, we become part of the machinery of the I, state. I agree. And the way it, it wants to eat itself, yeah. Uh, yeah. the way it requires, um, you know, constant upheaval and, yeah. you know, constant cycles of revolutions and renewal and, uh, you know, uh, division and all that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. I mean, for me, uh, when we met, um, I, I absolutely agree. The, the notion of empire is deeply... And it still is for me deeply problematic, and mm-hmm. and the reason I sent you through that JFK is that our family have been sitting in this for the first time of our lives a contagion class, um, mm-hmm. and so we we are getting uh, a a insight into what that is um, and what the, I mean. Meg's Jewish, so she is much closer to that. My old people were um, contagion classes quite a few centuries before, so. It's. Uh, oh, what's I, what's that history? Just in a mm-hmm. nutshell. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt your flow. But yeah, so my I've got Gaelic, Celtic, and Norse ancestry. All right. Yeah. 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 That's my, they're my old people. What, what was what was their contagion? Syphilis. <laughs> no. Hey, just, hey. hey. <laughs> just jokes. Just jokes. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Civilization. Yeah. Yeah. Malnutrition. Diarrhea. Yeah. Potato um, famine. Um, yeah, so I, I feel that um, th- that the the why why I'm interested in um, something like the American presidential election is, um, and I've never had any as an adult. I've never had any um, interest really, apart from just following the the charade of it and the um, the, the spectacle of it, and being always cynical about that system because it's not a circle. It's, it's not people coming together in a circle to listen, um, which uh, is what I've been leaning into and rebuilding in my own community and neighborhood and understanding that, that the power is disseminated when we meet in circles and rather than in podiums. And so all that kind of grandstanding. But now that I'm on this sort of in this side of the contagion class and experience um, a systemic, uh, uh, well, uh, the full brunt of the state being locked out of all local civic buildings um, and uh, swimming pools, um, libraries. Um, there's no seat at the local government table. Um, it's also a very powerful group, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, 
you know, the the, the pandemic's still raging, and I mean, there's no way. Mm. I mean, it's it's powerful enough and numerous enough. It's not exactly a minority that um, you know you, you, you government wouldn't dare impose lockdowns again, even you know, no matter how many spikes we get in uh, COVID deaths and those numbers now. Yeah, is, oh, uh, definitely. You, you know that your institutions are intimidated. Oh, definitely. Your but contagion I, I, class I, I, I is, don't, is actually quite a powerful, uh, powerful group, I, I don't, and it is decentralized, and it is. Yeah, <laughs> you know I, what I mean? There are no leaders. It's just, um, you know, it's a it's it's a true grassroots um, um, uprising, uh, you know, um, manipulated as it is by yeah. by uh, you know dark money and uh, you know um, <laughs> the billionaire class See, that would uh, prefer to do anything other than pay their fucking taxes. Yeah, when I mean when you when you use this language, I'm so I feel so alienated from that. Like I'm I'm just talking about the 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 very small percentage, probably four or five percent of us who um, didn't line up for a, a vaccine, were not against vaccines, but were certainly against mandates. Um, really tried to uh, have conversations around that, but had no. Um, basically, our channels for conversation were shut down. Particularly, I, I mean, I've I've written several uh, articles for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age, opinion pieces over the years, and um, I wrote three or four. I'm um, trying to voice the, the position from someone who uh, is vaccine skeptical um, and wanting to outline the reasons why. And they're all ignored. And just seeing, you know, the head kicking that's gone in. in Bros, if you take the, the red flags out, like trans, like links to trans, you know, exclusionary, you know, content and, you know, links to RFK, if you take out a few of the red flags, but then, I, I, you know, I imagine cer certainly that, 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 that opinion would be, would be respected. But like, I feel like that, that's, respected. that's just a... If we've got people... Man, we've got people in, in Deakin who are, you know, uh, grappling with those things and working. We've got people in every university who are grappling with it and, and working exactly on those ideas and who are studying those things. But, um, you know, they're, they're doing it without the without the ideological, uh, you know, intrusions um, that, that are, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's contaminated <laughs> reasoning. You know, so when you write something, it's you have those red flags popping up. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be rejected. Think, you think can't, people you are, can't go. Ah, oh, see, look, they don't want to hear the truth. Pe people so are steered. Yeah, yeah, everyone wants the truth. I think all of us are steered um, um, by whatever media that we trust, and so to have an open mind about any journalist that, like, we've got a whole bunch of journalists that we follow. Our media ecology is really diverse, but they're mostly from what would used to be called the liberal media, um, and they're they're kind of seeing the uh, capture of the, of those organisations. They're seeing the pieces that are no longer allowed to be published, and they're creating independent Substack um, spaces, and they're they're going it alone. and And so, while obviously there's a, a, a necessity to to filter everything and to go to the sources of, of investigative journalists who have left what is known as mainstream media and creating um, new medias out of that. That's a completely different story to... But almost nobody, mainstream media is a minority now. Almost nobody's listening to it or viewing it. It's, it's, it's true. Most people are getting their, it's are getting true. their information it, from you know, citizen journalists, most people are getting yeah. it from, you know, yeah. amateurs and any bastard with a bloody um, Yeti mic and a laptop, you know. Um, that's where most of the information is coming yeah. from. And therefore... And, you know, that's a... the majority of the media that I consume. It's yeah. Like, I'm, I'm looking mostly at libertarian, um, you know, media all, all the time um, yeah. because I'm very interested in watching with a critical eye where these patterns are going. Yeah, but even just um, that term libertarian... I'm not inhaling any ABC news at all. Yeah. But even that term libertarian, it's just always used today in this reductive right sense, whereas actually left libertarianism is anarchism. And so like we don't we can't even have Absolutely. a we can't even have a conversation about libertarianism at the moment without it just creating a red flag. So I guess this is what I'm 
you know, like I want to be able to talk about the medicalization of trans kids. I want to show people the um, documentaries I've seen with detransitioning children or young people who who basically saying, I don't want, I want to tell people about this and they're being cancelled. You know, like why, why can't we have a conversation so that people are transitioning, they can actually see that let's let's transition in a fluid sense or let's transition for a number of years and and like really feel into this before we have big pharma intersect into our lives like and you know so like which is mostly what happens that that's the actual treatment protocol it is you know it's 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 just for a start like you know trans is is the tiniest sliver of a percentile of, of of the population uh, it still is in and some the American tiniest, the tiniest sliver of that. Yeah, every it's... now and then you find a story, which when yeah. you dig into it, you find there's other circumstances and other mm. contexts going yeah. on, or it's an outright lie, like the bloody, you know, the famous kitty litter tray in the classrooms mm. piece, which they're still bellowing in the Senate, yeah. you know, in, in the US, and still bellowing across social media and writing it on toilet walls, mm. you know, all over Australia as well. You know, it's <laughs> these things, bros. It's um, you know, it's 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 could, it's not yeah. like it, overinflating the issue in the tiniest, rarest in, instances where things go wrong. Um, well, and that's I mean, and it is and it is tiny t- and it is rare. Tavistock, you know, Tavistock, highlighting those things is um. But Tavistock in London was shut down because it, because the harm was systemic. Is, Tyson, it's sorry. Tavistock in London was shut down because the harm to young people was systemic. So I, I don't think you can say this is just like, it, it's a bit like what's unfolding now with COVID vaccines and, and the level of degrees of, ad, of what? adverse effects. So like over 50% of the population? Or... I I don't have those figures um, yeah, on me, but, but, it, but I mean, Tavistock was shut down because of harm to children, harm to young mm-hmm. people. So, um, so you... I, I don't. You, you I don't know, know what the percentage not, is. They're not shutting down, you know, any of the institutions, um, you know, uh, that are that are responsible or in which you know uh, mass shootings are occurring and mass shootings becoming a systemic thing. You know, it's, but, um, but but mass shootings are uh, carried out by by one individual, not an institution, not a not a public <laughs> institution. No, but it is the, this. This distributed disinformation uh, complex that I'm talking about that does incite violence and it incites the kind of terrorism that is the lone wolf thing. It's not even uh, separate cells like you might find in some international terror organizations. It's actually, um, you know, so it's not even secret cells. It's it's highly individualized. You know? I, so, I, I mean, the, that most recent one, you know, it's the... <laughs> You know, they're, they're, I mean, pe- people are going to uh, Russian social me- media, which isn't uh, moderated, you know, in order to get these manifestos out and in order to um, access the content they mm-hmm. they desire for the radicalization and all the rest. Um, you know, it, it is an information complex and it, it is it is sponsored mm-hmm. and it is funded mm-hmm. by, you know, extremely wealthy groups and individuals around the globe. Mm. Um, at the same time as they're sponsoring and funding a whole heap of conspiracy theories around, um, I don't know, the tiny percentage of liberal billionaires around the place, like, you know, George Soros and people like that, you know, you've probably come across quite a bit. Like you would have come across, you know, a lot of people talking about Soros, uh, talking about Rothschilds, et cetera, et cetera. You won't have the same people telling you about Peter Thiel or Warren Buffett or, you know, any of these names. Mm. Um you know, it's it's a, I, I, it, I'm not. Or it's the tiniest shift in focus. I'm not. I'm not, just, not on board. That is just focusing on a few little <laughs> bits and inflating them beyond yeah. what the reality is or what the importance is. Yeah. It is a narrative focus, yeah. and it's a narrative that is wrong story. It's a narrative that is, um, mm. you know, it it's good story though. It's wrong story, but it's good story because there's spirit there. Mm. You know, there are angels and demons. There is good and evil. There is, you know, there is a war. Um, mm. You know, it's good story. And I know that's what's been attractive um, to a lot of people in my community, in my family. Yeah. Yeah, I I, th- I feel like um, <laughs> there is I, there's sort of this misfiring between us. Like, um, I think that 
you're really fixated on or interested in um, these marginal this marginal power or this power that comes from stru- you know some some big big you can say w- wealthy wealthy dudes who are um, promulgating um, certain narratives uh, to to suit certain political or control uh, paradigms. But what I what I I guess what I'm I'm really trying to bring into this is that at the same time we have public institutions, white colonial institutions um, and medias that are promulgating another form of misinformation and medical fascism is coming out of that. Absolutely. So, so that Absolutely. So, so basically yeah. we've got fascism that that's coming happens. from a grassroots way that is being manipulated and we've got fascism that's coming through an institutional sense. And so that that's and and when I had so this, what's, what's the difference between medical fascism and then the the kind of autocratic sort of and fascist impulses that come through regular, you know, uh, impositions of colonial state institutions like the stuff that's been happening for the last two hundred years? Oh, I mean, I, I think that uh, the inability for I mean the the, the uh, we've got single mums who. Um, are getting visited by docs around here for the smallest misdemeanors. Like, for example, a friend's car got crashed by a tree branch and her, and her child, her 10-year-old, was in the car and just got out, like, like moments before, and, and the, the branch brushed against him. She checked him over. Um, the, the, the police came and did a report on the thing, and she, she, she checked, as a mum, she checked over her son and didn't um, take him to hospital because she devised that she didn't he, he didn't need it that he was in a state of shock went home had a hot bath she was visited by docs the next day for there was it's like this um, almost this mandating mentality that you must go and report yeah uh, all of these things to I'm familiar with that yeah yeah, you, absolutely. But, um, and you know, from yeah, long long experience. Yeah. Hey, this is terrible. Um, You've got to pick up kids. Got three, we've got three minutes yeah. to wrap up, and then I've got to run to the car and then go and pick up the kids. Sure. Um, well, we. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, we got a little. Just, way. just. <laughs> yeah, but I, 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 I enjoyed it. I like Me it. Me too. And, um, Me too. I feel feel like it was a good yarn. Yeah, and I, I don't think the object of a yarn is to arrive at some kind of agreement or yeah. I can compromise or halfway spot or another one. Sure, and it's not to arrive at winners and losers, yeah. um, etc. Um, you know, when people say we need to have these conversations, and uh, maybe they need to be having yarns instead. Mm. Uh, I don't know. What do you reckon? Yeah, yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed it, and yeah. uh, love to the fam, and love, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm, good to um, chat. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad our families, you know, get to uh, get to keep being friends, and I get to, you know, come out and harvest some wood out your way from time to time, and yeah. and enjoy that that bread from your awesome oven. Yeah, and come yeah. come visit. There's always yeah, a bit yeah. here. Yeah, we'd love to come out and stay again. Yeah. Well, no more lockdown. Let's <laughs> uh, let's make it happen, bro. It's been a while. Thanks. Yeah, really good to yarn. Yeah, great, right. great to yarn. Thanks, um, Dyson. <laughs>